Okay, so this is a summary of what I'm going to do. Now, we've had an oral history project which has been going for several years. Shirley and I and some of the other people have interviewed quite a lot of landlords or people who were children that lived in the pubs to find out about as many of the pubs in Stonehouse as we possibly could. And I've already, Shirley, me, Janet, have already talked about quite a lot of those pubs and talked about those memories. So that's not quite what I'm going to do tonight. What I'm going to do is give more of an overview of a little bit of the history, how the pubs came to be, and uh, where I got at the beginning, a short timeline. And that's a little bit wordy. <laughs> I, people tell me off, but I just want, so the first few pages have got a few words on because I want to explain the history. Then I'm going to go into all the pubs that were there around about 1871 and tell you where they were, a little bit about them, a little bit about what coaching inns were, where the pubs were and what happened to them. So I'm going to start out. Oh, you will notice I've got on the bottom about the copyright. Um, I, it's all our members mainly here, but just reminding you that some of these photographs on here are copyright and also the research and work we've done. So it shouldn't be recorded or copied without permission. Okay, so I'm starting off with this, which looks like a lot of words, um, but public drinking spaces have been regulated from at least the 15th century. So people had to have licenses to sell drink to the public. There were all sorts of complicated licenses and apologies to anybody who knows all about this history. I've got three great big books on it. It's very complicated, the different laws that were passed. There were different motives. One of the motives was to control the drinking. So it was actually quite a, a good motive to try and help people not to be too drunk. So there were the temperance society trying to control people's behavior, but also there was the side of making money for local councils, for government by charging for these licenses. So the laws were made for different reasons. And there were several different types of drinking space. So the inns, the taverns and the alehouses they were more professional businesses, catering for customers wanting food and drink, possibly accommodation, stabling for their horses. And they grew up, they multiplied when the coaching trade started because those were their customers. And then there were beer houses and those started with people making their own beer and simply selling it from their front room. So there were quite a few of that type of establishment. And in 1830, the Beer House Act was passed. And you'll notice as I talk, the difference that made to Stonehouse pubs, because they wanted to try and reduce gin drinking. So they thought they would make it easier for people to get a license to sell beer from their house. Of course, what that did was cause a large number of casual beer houses to spring up because they didn't have to pay much to get a license. So they could make some money by sending, selling their beer. But as with so many acts of parliament, there were unintended consequences because what happened was the professional places went more because they were trying to compete, compete with all these casual beer houses. So in 1869, they passed another one, more or less taking all that back and making it more difficult to get a license, encouraging the closure of all those beer houses. So all those ones that opened up between 1830 and 1860 began to change and the traditional pubs started developing. They grew into the named pubs, the breweries got involved and pubs became tied. And I'll talk a bit more about the 20th century. So that's the background to it, the 19th century background. And you've got to remember that an alehouse could sell all types of alcohol, wine, gin, brandy, whatever, but the beer house, could only sell beer, maybe cider perhaps. So the timeline 
of the history of pubs in Stonehouse goes right back, there's records right back to 1491, where someone paid a license for a tavern in the parish. We don't know where that is, but there was one as far back as that. So all that time there were taverns, beer houses. And then in the 18th century, those taverns found a new trade from the coaches traveling through the village. And that's partly why nearly all our pubs and inns are on the main road. I know Stonehouse is on the main road anyway, but of course they were on the main road because they were hoping to get those coaches traveling through. And you can see by the in the 19th century, which is mainly what I'm gonna talk about, You've got the Globe Inn by 1812, the Crown and Anchor by 1815, the Woolpack by 1820, the Plough by 1840. Then remember I talked about that Beer Act. From the 1840s, we got at least nine unnamed beer houses in Stonehouse. And they grew into places like the Brewers, the Royal Oak, the Ship, the Cross Hands, maybe the Spa. But in the 1850s, the bigger breweries started to see the opportunities. And from then they started to buy up the pubs and those small beer houses gradually closed. So in 1881, there were about 10 licensed, licensed pubs in Stonehouse. And we've got two now, the Woolpack and the Globe, if you don't count Stonehouse Court Hotel and the Magpies. So that's really the timeline of the history. Um, in, so in 1871, the population was about 2,000, and by the 1890s, nearly all these below, which are the ones I'm going to talk about tonight, were owned by local breweries, like the Stroud Brewery, the Cheltenham Hereford Brewery, Smith's Brewery, Nailsworth. There's loads of them. If you're interested, you can find out about those. So we've got these four, which were inns or taverns or alehouses, one of those which catered for all sorts of food and drink, accommodation, stabling for horses. And then you've got all these beer houses, which often started out with people brewing their homemade beer, and they grew into the pubs that we know today, or some of them we might know today. Okay, little bit about coaching inns. This is complicated. <laughs> I've got some notes to look at, if I can find them. Right. I've really tried my best and apologies to find out about which uh, inns or pubs were coaching inns because there's a lot of talk about the bath go coach going through and the wool pack being the coaching inn and the bath road being built for the bath coach. And I have tried looking at bath archives, the bath uh, Cheltenham local. Uh, history, library, all sorts of places, and nobody can find a timetable for the Bath coach. Um, so I've looked my best and I found various references to the Bath coach actually coming through Stonehouse, but not where they stopped. So I don't know. But I did manage to find out that there's all sorts of different coaches. So when you say a coaching in, you don't really know which sort of coach you're talking about. And these are the main sorts that you had. So you had the mail coach, which was the elite one. They were fast and expensive. They carried the mail, but they also carried premium passengers, like luxury, so that only the rich could afford that one. I would guess maybe that was the one coming from Bath. Then you got the post coaches that were one step down. They carried a limited number of passengers, but they didn't carry mail, which is weird, as they're called the post coach. Um, then you got the ordinary stage coaches, which were the cheapest they could do it. So packing in as many passengers as they could. And then you got the market coaches. And the market coaches usually ran just short distances. So maybe from Stonehouse to Stroud, maybe to Nailsworth, somewhere like that. So all those different types of coaches were going. So when you call somewhere a coaching in, it might just mean that the market coaches were stopping there, or it might mean that the elite male coach was stopping there. And there's a picture of the Crown and Anchor Hotel. And I think you can probably see, if I can make my little spotlight work, you can see, I think that Crown and Anchor was one of the main coaching places. You can see a coach there. You can see this chap on a very posh looking horse. So I don't think there's much question that the Crown and Anchor was catering for the coaches coming through. 
So this is where I found some of the information in, in Wiley's Almanac of 1894, which I've just bought from eBay, which is a very useful thing, because it told me that the cross hands, the Royal Arms, the Woolpack, the Globe Inn and the Crown in Anchor were all posting houses, places for horses to be sabled, travellers to stay. And these are the established ones. If you look, they're the same ones that are the ale houses and the inns. Some of the others might have been as well, because I've got a picture of the Nag's Head, which was in Regent Street. And on the sign of that, it has Posting House. So quite a lot of them were trying to cater for those travellers. OK, now this is a um, map, as you can see. Um, I've just got to get my spotlight thing again. These are the pubs in Stonehouse in 1871, so going by the census of 1871. So number one, which is here, is was the ship in, and you can see these are gathered round by the canal. Number two, the cross hands. The cross hands isn't there anymore, but that was one of the main alehouses that had a full license to it. And there were there were also I'm not, wasn't there in 1871, but there were beer houses that were going on the wharf or the edge of the canal and the railway there. The number three up Regent Street, as I'm going up, is the Nags Head. The building's still there. Number four, you've got the wool pack. And then you're starting to get all the ones that are on the main road. So you've got five, the Royal Arms, which is gone. You've got six, the New Inn, which most people have never heard of but we think the building is still there. Then you've got number seven, the Crown and Anchor, which is now the doctor's surgery. Number eight, the Globe Inn, one of the two we've got left. Number, oh, there's nine disappeared too. <laughs> Nine's disappeared. Nine is here, which, which is the Royal Oak, which is not there anymore. Sorry, I dropped off my map. Number 10, the Brewer's Arms which until recently was a nursery, but it's for sale. Number 11 was the Plough Inn, which was on the corner of Woodcock Lane, which is gone now. And number 12 at Gloucester Road was the Coach and Horses, which is completely gone. And then we've got the one out on its own, the Spa Inn. And I think the reason the Spa grew up was there was quite a lot of little houses and cottages there. And of course, another thing I could talk about is the diversification. So they obviously started up with the spa. So they own, not only had the beer house, but they had the spa going. So got 13 main ones there in 1871. There may have been other beer houses, but we haven't found out where they are. So if I start out and you'll notice, I didn't mention the King William. We thought until recently that the King William was a pub down by the canal, a separate one. But since doing some research on the ship in, we're pretty sure that the, the King William is in fact the ship. And it was called the, um, the King William first. In 1851 census, you've got Thomas Bayliss living in a beer shop called the King William. This is the oldest picture I can find of that area. So if I get my spotlight, um, you can see this is coming along the canal. This bridge is now that very big new bridge. This is, that's going down to Bridge End that way. The ship in is here. You can just see it there. And of course it used to be next to the wharf. The wharf had the railway, the Nailsworth Railway running through it. So a prime place for beer houses and pubs next to the canal trade and the railway trade and the various people who lived down there. So, so there's the ship. It would have been the ship by then, but we think it started out as the King William. OK, and here is an aerial view of that area. I've put some... Um, arrows because I wasn't sure I was going to be able to get this spotlight. So the cross hands was, it, actually I'll show you the ship first, the ship's here. So this is the crossroads. There's the mount, which is the doctor's surgery. You've got the ship in on the corner here. There's the cross hands, 
next to Whitcliffe College. And then you've got the railway coming along, the canal coming along, and this is the wharf. And we think there's probably some, maybe was a beer house in perhaps one of these houses that lived here that um, were there on the edge of the wharf. So it's quite, a, we haven't got many pictures of the cross hands. You can see this is 1936. Okay, so here's, here's the ship in. I think this picture's probably 1930s, it might be 50s, I haven't got a date of it, but that's the bottom of Regent Street with the wall that's still there now. And you can see what a dangerous corner that was. Anybody who, li who lived here when the traffic started coming, there was plenty of accidents, people coming out of there. And we did have a zebra crossing put there um, for a while before they knocked it down. The ship, I mean, not the separate crossing. Um, this is a lot of writing, but it you how a lot of pubs started out. So in 1834, John King put two dwelling houses up there. So they built us dwelling houses and they were rented by Thomas Bayliss. And he gradually started at one of these beer houses. If you look at the date, 1841, that's after we had that beer act. And so we've got him with his King William and we've got the cross hands over the road and they're just beer houses. They're just people selling beer from their front rooms. But by 1851, oh, that's right, 1851, he's, it's called the King William. But then in 1855, he acquired both houses and here you've got them enlarging it, look. So in 1861, he's renting it to Robert and Caroline Glick and it's called the Ship Inn. And they've got the, the Nailsworth branch line and also very often they were doing other things. So Robert Blick is a carpenter. So it's probably Caroline was running the pub. He was doing his carpentry business. But if you have a look at this by as early as 1874, he'd sold that building to the brewers, Watts, Halliwell and Stanton. So as early as 1874, those brewers were buying up the pubs. They later became Stroud Brewery. And then all that time, those landlords were obviously tied to the brewery. They were selling, the, they were having to pay probably to use it. They had to get their licenses. It was a beer house, so they were selling only beer. But then by 1916, the landlord of the ship in was very cunning. And he realized, I think, that the cross hands was going to close. So he asked for the license fiddler status, which is the full license to be transferred to the ship in. And I, we think that's when the cross hands closed. You probably can't see this, but that's where I found it from, Gloucester Chronicle in 1916, because they wanted to reduce the number of beer houses. So they granted him the license because, um, I'll show, try and show you if you can read it. Here we go. The effect of the removal, so that's moving the license from the cross hands to the ship, was to reduce the number of beer houses by one. And they were very keen to reduce the number of beer houses and just get the more professional pubs going. Um, thank you very much to Chaz Thursfield, who's just recently donated us a nice copy of the Stonehouse Guide from 1976 to 77. So we take an enormous jump from 1874 to 1974, but you can see the type of thing that they were providing by then. There's a picture of the ship in and they're providing bar snacks, hot and cold meals, coffee, old time sing song most Saturday nights. So they've expanded in the 70s into different things. There's the ship just before it exploded in 1997. Um, Probably this one, not so much because it didn't have the trade, but we, as we know, they, they were putting that big road through it. I'll show you the picture. And thank you to Don for let, using this slide, which is Don Gaunt's slide, really, but it's a good picture to show. It's a sad picture of an old pub coming down. And this is what we've got now. So the ship in was here right in the middle of the road. You tend to think that it was over here, but of course the road went up here and it was much narrower. So th those traffic lights are right on the spot of where the ship in was. This is the garden down, going down to the canal. And just here is where the cross hands was. So they were opposite each other on, this, on the road there. 
now I'm going to go on to the cross hands over the road and thank you to the town council for letting us um, have a look at the old files um, that when they cleared out the town hall that um, Rich Lacey has moved them um, to a safe place but we were allowed to, to take scans of some of the pictures and it's the first time we've seen a photograph of what the cross hands looks looked like and there it, it that's it I'll just get my thing up again you can't seem to okay so that's where it was it's it belongs to Wycliffe but I think it closed pretty early and Wycliffe were using it for storage but when you think it was a fully licensed place and a posting house so it must have had stables for horses I don't know when this um, was taken I think probably 60s or 70s okay um, something that I've been trying to collect but there are very few and far between the, this is this is my token the first one that I bought um, this is from the cross hands in and you can see um it says cross hands in jh cook john henry cook stone house and it's got 3d th the old threepence which is about a penny today and these tokens were seem to be quite popular during the end of that century they were used for a variety of things. They were used to pay for drinks in advance. So if people hired a meeting hall, if they say paid three shillings or whatever it was to hire the hall, the landlord would give them three shillings worth of tokens, which then they could give out to the people who attended the meeting as payment for attending the meeting, but that ended it in the cross hands in. So the landlord wasn't gonna lose out on that. But again, they were also used for if you played a game and the loser had to pay the round, sometimes towards the end of the evening, the other people didn't necessarily want their drink then. They were going home or they'd had enough. So what happened then, the friend would get a token from over the bar and, and give it to the people that he owed the money if it was a round. And so they could go in the following day with their throw up me token and they could get a pint and a half for that, I think. And sometimes they were offered as prizes in games like darts and things like that. So anybody got any pub tokens? I would be very pleased to have another one. I've got, I've got some more to show you further along. So drinking was an important social activity in 1901, as we can see by the number of pubs that there were. And according to one estimate, every male drinker consumed on average 73 gallons of beer per year, which is one and a half pints a day, which doesn't sound quite as much when you say one and a half a day, but also 2.4 gallons of spirits as well. Um, beer cost about tuppence a pint. But in 1914, the government was pretty keen to stop people drinking. They wanted people to be working hard on the war effort. You can see this notice, don't take alcoholic drinks on Mondays. So anybody who sat there now with their, their pint of beer or their glass of wine, just think back in 1914, you would be encouraged not to do that. And they brought in restricted opening hours. And they outlawed buying the rounds. And that's when the tokens went out because so much of that was to do with getting your round in. And we think the cross hands might have been affected by this. They tried to close some of the places and we think it closed in 2006, uh, 1916. Right, I'm going up now Regent Street, I've got to the Nags Head. Um, I've got many pictures of this. So that's the old sub rooms, which is now Wycliffe College. Hold on, let me get my spotlight back. Um, so that's the sub rooms and that there is the Nags Head sign. So it's in here and you can see there's the building today. It's a private house now and probably was a private house when it was the Nags Head because it was a beer house. So he lived in the house and he ran a coach and travel business, Edward Stevens, but he also had a room where he was selling beer. So it's that often comes up the diversification they weren't just run. the people who had the beer houses were often running something else as well like the boat repair or the coach and bus travel business or the carpenter something like that right 
there's a, an absolutely lovely picture. By this time, it's gone from they're still running the coach trips and it's um, Ford by now. So you can see on the wall, you've got AW Ford and you've got the Nags Head sign there, which I think is, if you look closely, you can see it's Godsell and Son. So they were the people that owned it or owned the license, certainly. And it also says on here, posting house. So they were also a place for some of these coaches to stop. Oh, there's an awful lot there, which I'm not going to read again, but you can see the same story. It's a beer house. It gets tied to the God source. Uh, it, Edward Stevens is an interesting person because he moves to Elm House in the middle of by the Crown and Anchor. And he took charge of the post office, which was in Hearns. And he's also got a very interesting son, Vivian Stevens, who was the post boy that alerted everybody to the fire at Stonehouse Court. So he was delivering the post very early in the morning. He saw smoke coming up in 1908 from Stonehouse Court. And he ran all the way back up to the main police station to call out the police and, and get the fire brigade. But unfortunately, of course, they couldn't put the fire out. Well, they did in the end. But and you can see what happened. It turned into a Hauleus. Then we're going up to the corner, the wall pack in, which is one of only two pubs still open in 2020. And there's a picture there and you can actually see on the top again, the name of, at that point, it was Cheltenham Ales. Cheltenham Ales and Stout, I think it is. So you've got the wool pack in, but you've got the name of the brewery. I think that's round about the 1930s, that picture. And this picture here is after the Hemmings had done it up. It's interesting to see here that they've blocked in the windows at that point, because these are original windows. So when they came to uh, refurbish, they found these lovely original windows in there. It certainly makes it look very attractive. Um, I've got a much longer talk about the wool pack in uh, because we interviewed uh, Len Taylor, whose great grandmother, I think I've got that right, ran it for 60 years and he had some of the rent books. You can see it was owned by Nailsworth Brewery in 1901 to. 1908, but look at all the different breweries that took it over. Cheltenham and Hereford, Whitbreads. And this is one, this lady, Mrs. Eliza Taylor. She was landlady around about from 1891 to 1851, 60 years. And that's what they gave her, that piece of paper, nothing else. They just gave her that piece of cardboard saying in recognition and appreciation of the fact she worked there for 60 years, the wool pack in. Right, I'm going back Bath Road a little. I'm just gonna, what's the time, Andra? 8.04, sorry. Um, this is the Royal Arms at the bottom of Burdett Road. And this is one of the few ones that haven't come from being a house or a barn or a hotel. I think it's probably purpose built and it's on the corner and very likely built just after the railway because that's when they were building houses to go with the increased trade, the increased business that came from the railway. And we've got a corner pub. And if you look at the pub histories, so many of the big towns, when they put the new streets in, they built the corner pub first. And that's, I think, that's the only one that's actually on a corner like that, going round the corner. And this is what's going round the corner now. Um, which name I can't remember of the, 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 oh, Springfield Court, isn't it? That picture's later than we thought. It's about the nineties. We did think it was the eighties, but since I've realized it's the nineties. That's what it looked like in 1911 when George Topnell was the landlord. 
And you can see Stroud Brewery Company's Celebrated Ales and Stout. Right, I'm going along Bath Road to the New Inn, which is a new thing for us, um, which we discovered looking at the censuses. Um, and we think by looking at the buildings around that that's probably the building that the New Inn was in. It's interesting to see that in 1851, Thomas Godsell was living there and it was at that point a beer house. So maybe the start of his beer career. Joshua Merritt is also someone who went on to be landlord up at the Royal Oak. Um, but I don't know how long it was for, it was an inn for, we haven't been able to find it after 1871, but it was definitely one of the beer houses at that point in time. I know it's not Naylor Powell anymore, but it was when I took that photograph. And then we go up to the Crown and Anchor, really the, the, the main pub, I would say, in Stonehouse, probably, because it's, it was the biggest. And this is a picture in 1890. There, there were all sorts of houses and cottages and shops on that site. And I dare say that one of them was a beer house, but they developed it, William Fryer developed it, into the Crown and Anchor Commercial Inn. You can see it there. And this is obviously this, oh God, let me get me a pointer. Here's the stables, which is today's chemist. And here's the assembly rooms. And that's what was in the middle. And most of it is still in there. When they changed it to the frontage we're more familiar with today, built it round that basically to posh it up because at the end of the 1890s the pub trade was sort of at its height they were getting the coaches coming through they were getting the travelers from the railway so they made it look posher and built the front on and there it is with its posh front um, built, built on um on. try and get me thing back um, so you can see this is, oh, I think this is sort of turn of the century, but it might be a little bit later, maybe 1910. You can see the posh front that they've built on, but you can also see the things they were offering already because they were being encouraged to be not just a beer house, not just a drinking place, but more of a community place. So we've got a bowling green, billiards, skit lally. Crown and Anchor livery and bait stable that says posting and we see we've got garage there so they were starting to take different vehicles so in there I don't know whether that's a coach I think it possibly is but it also had this entrance isn't there anymore that was you had to drive through underneath to get to the back because this building was more or less joined to the houses which are just next to it. So where you've got a drive now that you can drive your car through, you had these doors and this enclosed way of taking your horse through to the back. You can see the milestone and you can see the tree. That tree still survives. That's the tree that's, that's there today on that little piece of land by the memorial. Um, the Millennium Stone is here. So it's one of the few trees. They were planted round about 1900. And you can see they've got the protective thing on them. So that, that's a really nice picture. So you can see that tree when it was first planted. And these two are the tokens from the Crown and Anchor. So one and a half pence would probably just about have got you a pint. Thank you to Stroud Museum for sending me those pictures because that isn't mine. I, I so wish it was mine, <laughs> but it's not. It's in Stroud Museum. Um, so I'll just get rid of that. Then. That's a picture of the Crown and Anchor in 1950s. And at that point, Uh, lost me, lost me pointer now. Okay, you can see the car, and I think I'm pretty sure that by that time it happened round about the fifties that they cut the drive through to the back. 
this rather a nice old car there, the 1950s. And you can see you've got the two entrances for the bar. I mean, that went on for, I think that was until it closed in the 90s. So you've got the public bar there, you went in there, and the main front door here, and then the, the lounge bar here and the restaurant over here. today looking very nice and we are so lucky that they kept it and didn't knock the whole thing down and put a co-op supermarket there which was what the plans were going to be but they didn't luckily the doctors bought it and uh, have treated it very nicely then you go up to the globe inn um the globe i think the houses were there well before 1812 they it probably started from a fairs barn so they're probably having a fair on the green and there was a barn there which obviously people could come and keep their various stocks in but it's mentioned as the globe in about 1812 and you can almost see that it looks as though it's been started from two houses because when you see that old picture there which is i think about the 1930s You've actually got two doors. You can see it's the same building because you can see the um, can see the these windows are actually very similar along the top, but they changed the frontage. It, they still they've still got the bay windows, but in a completely different way. And of course, you've just got the one door in the middle instead of having these two doors like that. And that, that's a, a very nice picture of it. So you're, you're standing where, <clears throat> I was going to say the hairdressers, but quiet ways. So this is actually the vicarage grounds. Uh, so where we're standing here is the entrance to the vicarage, because you have to remember that Elm Road wasn't at all made up. It was just a muddy path. Um, coming down here, you, you walked down there, just a path, um, and this was the entrance to the vicarage. And for Queen Victoria's Jubilee 1887, they put up this fantastic sign. And somebody took, and there's, there's a lady in here, a rather spooky lady, which is quite interesting. But all these people are all dressed up, ready for the Jubilee. But you can see the globe rather interestingly. At the back there, there were cottages down the side as well, which were demolished to make the um, car park in the end. But And these houses as well, these houses here, they were all demolished because the ones we see now, the ones they did up in the 80s, are behind that. So they've got shops and probably gardener's garage there, which we don't see. So it's a very interesting picture there of the Jubilee. And we go up to the Royal Oak, which is just under the railway bridge. And I so wish we had a picture of the Royal Oak, <laughs> we haven't. This is the nearest we get to it. So it's, well, we got slightly nearer, which I'll show you in a minute, but there it says the Royal Oak Inn and these lovely children standing having their photo taken. So you're going up Gloucester Road and there's Gordon Terrace, there and the, the brewers just in there and then Gab's farm just here. I hope I've got Gab's farm right. I hope it's Gab's farm. Um, it was, we think it's probably demolished in the nine. I don't know when it was demolished. I Maybe the forties or maybe it's later than that. It's where John Kerry's is now. So this, this is a good picture to the town council because this is when we found in the files there an aerial photo from round about 1960 so if you look at this you can see here's the garage so it was the cinema but by this time it's been turned into to a garage or a car repair place um, you can see the square here here's the farm and a lot of these buildings are farm buildings connected with the farm 
And there, we still haven't got a picture of the crossands because it's already been demolished. So this is where John Kerry's is now. And that's where um, the, sorry, the Royal Oak, the Royal Oak was. If, if anybody's got any memories of it or knows what, I think these must be farm buildings of some sort. That looks like a caravan. Okay. Um, and these were knocked down in the 60s. A meadow road goes straight up through there. Um, right. So where have we got to now? Oh, yes, that's a very nice picture. Thank you, John McCallum, who gave us this from Tom Round Smith's collection. And we've almost got the, <laughs> almost, still not quite got the Royal Oak. It, it's in there. So here are the houses on the square, but the Royal Oak is sort of set back, so you still can't see it. Um, but it's a, a nice picture. 1903. And here are my Royal Oak tokens. I think these are both mine, yes. So you've got Henry Adams, so you can date that 1861 to 1881, two and a half pence. And Christopher Edwards, W. Edwards, the Royal Oak Inn. And that's where it was, um, just in, just in there. You can see where it was in there, the Royal Oak. And so we come up to the Brewer's Arms in Gloucester Road. And that again is Stroud Brewery Ales, round about 1930s. It's a nice picture from 1911 showing you it there. Just get that back. Um, so it's it's in. Let's move this. Go on. It's in here, and this that's it there. This house was demolished to make the car park. So that's the Brewers, and that's where um, the Nippy Chippy is now. It's for sale now. It's not a not a nursery. That's it, a few years ago when it was a nursery. Last, no, second to last, <laughs> so not too much longer. Um, this is the Plough Inn, which was on the corner of Woodcock Lane. Again, we haven't got much of a picture of it. I've got a sort of picture of it. Um, these are the buildings on the end. Here's Woodcock, here's... Um, Old, Old Ends Lane coming out, you can see the sign pointing to Woodcock Lane. That's where the buildings were. That's the Reddings. That's what's there now. So you've got the dentist on the corner there. And that's Gordon Terrace. So the Plough Inn was a farm, but Edward Sharp was running a beer house there. And this is the nearest we've got to a picture of it. Um, it in there. So we're coming up Gloucester Road. Here's Gordon Terrace here. Here's the chestnut tree, which is still there. And there, I'm pretty sure, but I can't be 100% sure, that that is the plough in on the corner. So it's, it's the only picture we've got of it. Oh, forgot the coach and horses. Coach and horses was up Gloucester Road, opposite the Reddings. That's what's there now. It's an interesting one. It was there in 1851, but it was demolished and these houses were built there. And the last one, the Spa Inn. Um, it's a very nice picture when it was done up in the 50s. And it closed in 2013 and luckily, it wasn't demolished. It has gone back to being a house because it started out being a house and then he had made a spa business of it. Is it called Fast State now, Andrew? Yeah. Um, 20 past. This is a lovely picture of the Baker family who ran it for about 50 years, I think, or 40 anyway. 
in the coronation. This is interesting because you can see he's licensed to sell beer and stout to be consumed on the premises. Uh, a little bit about why they closed. I think I've talked about it already. So they were taken over by the breweries. The breweries had them over a barrel basically because they loaned money to them. So they were owed the money, they were tied to them. Individual publicans found it harder to make a profit. So those small places like the New Inn, the Plough Inn, the Coach and Horses, the unnamed beer houses, they were all gone. And then the early 20th century, they tried to stop people drinking, the temperance movement. So they offered them incentives to close the pubs and many closed at that point. The First World War licensing cut the opening hours and raised the taxes. A different type of pub was encouraged entertainment, food, community orientated pubs. So we got some more closing, the Cross Hands, the Nags Head, the Royal Oak. And then in the seventies, again, you've got the big breweries monopolizing it. In Stonehouse, we didn't get so much of these things being refurbished in the brewery design. We got, um, most pubs retain their traditional look in Stonehouse. They added new things. In fact, it was a really good time, 70s and 80s. They were really busy. They had musical events, clubs, parties, started offering better food. So they thrived, really, until the changes in society just meant it, they couldn't be going. So you've got things like home entertainment, the TV, the films, the internet. Husbands used to go straight to the pub with their when they got their wages, but things changed a bit and women didn't expect their husband to go straight to the pub and spend all the money on drink. Also, you could get cheaper drink in the supermarkets. People's expectations changed. They went abroad. They could see the cafes and wine bars. They wanted something a little bit different. You've got the big super pubs, the small pubs couldn't compete. So they closed, they turned into restaurants and you've got the smoking ban. So that led to nearly all our pubs being closed. But things go full circle and we know that there's local small breweries increasing, people selling uh, their own ales, trying to make a living. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we still keep our two pubs. So that's the end of my presentation now. We've got presentations on the history of all these pubs. We have given them before, but it would be interesting if people would like to, we can show you the full presentations on any of these pubs. So if you feel you'd like to see that, then let us know. Don't forget to visit our website, Stonehouse History Group. And I am going to stop my talk there. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Vicky. Great stuff. Uh, I think we're all thirsty now. We've got a few oh, yeah. questions coming in and a few comments. Um, comment from Norman. Hi, Norman. Miles away, but welcome back virtually. It's very nice to see you. Um, Norman was saying, I thought the new inn was at Newtown, just along from the bottom on Old Ends Lane. Oh, yes, that was a different one. Yes. Oh, oh, where? Newtown. Yes, there was a new in there, definitely. And that one was much more of a big pub. This is a different one. It was only running for, I don't know, 20 or so years. It's because we looked at the census in 1871 and it was there then. But I don't think it lasted for long. So there were quite a few places called the new inn, I think. But I know the one he means down by Eastington, right. where the nursery is, I think, now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone, it says owner, I'm not sure what you own, but congratulations, I hope you're pleased with your purchase. Owner says, <laughs> have the pubs which have survived been added to the local list of locally important historic buildings? Woolpack's listed, isn't it? Now, I, I don't know, to be honest, but I, I, I would have thought they would have been. I don't know. That's something the town council can answer, is it? Um, Woolpack, I think, is listed. Um... But the Globe, I don't know. I don't think the Globe's listed. What? Well, Crown and Anchor's weird because the two buildings on the other side are listed. The bit in the middle isn't. Pe people watching may know more about this than I do, but I was chatting to Terry at the Globe not that long ago, and he said that the building of the Globe is not listed, but the well that's out the back is listed. 
Oh. And I was going to ask if you knew anything about the well, because if you go around the back into the sort of Skittle Alley area of the globe, there's a beautiful well in there that apparently is listed. Well, we've got some pictures of it in our globe talk, because when we talked to um, people, oh, it's Mary, isn't it? I think that was the landlady of the globe that we talked to. And she she showed us some super pictures of when they were refurbishing the Skittle Alley. So we have got some. So if people want to see them, I, I haven't been and looked at, at that for oh, a long time, but um, we've got pictures of it. I don't really know anything about it and um, whether they, the water was notoriously bad in Stonehouse, which is why the spa in was able to make a bit of a thing about theirs because they apparently their well was much nicer water than everybody else's. <laughs> Whether this is a publicity um, <laughs> story, I don't know. But that was their story is that um, their water was much the best, whereas a lot of other people's, and that's pretty well documented that the water in Stonehouse wasn't awfully brilliant. So. Well, another question on the globe. This is a question from me, because, again, just talking to Terry up there, he said to me before about there being a covenant on the globe. I'm not sure if you covered that in your talk. I had to dip out and then come back in again. But a covenant on the globe, which and I don't want to preempt your answer, but my understanding is there's a covenant on the globe to say the globe must always be a pub as long as there is a train station in Stonehouse. Hey, oh, well, I haven't heard of that one. So that's an interesting one to look up. I don't know. Anything about that? I, I don't know that you would have that sort of. Uh, do you think that would sort of thing could exist? I, I, I hope so. I love the sound of it. <laughs> I love the idea of it. I mean, it's it's an interesting thing. Maybe we'll have, have a chat with Terry about it and see. But if it's if it's true, it's the sort of thing that should be more more uh, widely known. But yeah, apparently so. The, the only thing we, I mean, we've got our story about the globe and the green. You know, the fight for the green, which I'm sure people have. Well, you. You said it in your talk, didn't you, on I the did. trees? Yeah. So the piece in front of the globe doesn't belong to the globe. It belongs to the town council. So as long as that belongs to the town council, that helps to keep it open, doesn't it? Because it's less yeah. likely to be developed. Definitely. Yeah, well, there's all sorts of interesting stories around there that I know they've appeared in, in the magazine over the years and stuff on the website. And, of course, the, the globe willow, of course, turns 100 next year and we're going to have a party. Yes, we do need to. We do need so, to celebrate the, the willow tree, definitely. We're all invited to the party. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, so a, a comment. There's, there's more questions and comments we're going to work through, but one's just come in from Katrina on the new inn at Newtown. Katrina says, Katrina Thompson, the new inn at Newtown was run by my great-great-grandparents, and I'd love to hear more about the Woolpack, as I'm related to Eliza and George King, who ran it. Oh, we, we'd love to talk to you, yes, because we, we, we talked to um, Len. Are you related to, oh, can we ask her if she's related to Len Taylor? Because it was Len Taylor we talked about. Um, Eliza and George King. George King was Eliza's first husband. She took she ran the wall pack with her husband, George King, initially. But then, unfortunately, George died. He drowned in the canal, I think. She, Katrina could probably confirm that. And um, she married Alfred Taylor, and then she carried on running the pub for years till 1951. So I don't know. It'd be interesting to is she related? It'd be interesting to find can, out about. We her. can use the slightly curious magic of technology to. You, <laughs> you've asked your question to Katrina by speaking it, and Katrina, you're more than welcome to type in the chat. It's all terribly exciting. Well, if she knows anything, or if she'd like to talk to us, if she gets in touch via our website or because she can go to info at stonehousehistorygroup.co.uk. We, we'd like to talk to her if she's related to Eliza and George King. It'd be great. I mean, I've got a wool pack talk. I mean, I, I'm hope if people want more talks on pubs, we can do, uh, we usually do two at a time because they're quite long. So maybe wool pack and ground and anchor or something like that we can do. Do you do Which, them in the pubs? Uh, well, we are doing them via Zoom at the moment. <laughs> That's what beer guns are for, Vicky. Come on. <laughs> well, okay, so Tim Tim Jackson has, has asked a question. Uh, would the Stonehouse Court have had a public bar? Oh, you mean no, no, because it was a private home. No, because it was owned by uh, Winterbottom. They they bought, I mean, it was always the Lord of the Manor, very, uh, you know, not public at all, really. And it was owned, it was very much owned by the Lord of the Manor. 
but looked after by the managers of the Lord, but, but not open to the public. And then Winterbottom bought it in 1906 and did it all up beautifully. And then of course it burned down, but he did it, he did it up again. It didn't, I shouldn't say it burned down because it didn't burn down. But of course all the lovely new refurbishments in, inside were spoiled, which was terrible because because he did it up to match, um, you know, as, as near with all the original features as he could get. And it went, but then he, they lived there for a length of time. And then when he died quite early on in the thirties, I think she lived there, Lady Winterbottom lived there till the seventies. She certainly wouldn't have had a public bar in there. No, it, it, when she sold it, it went to a business first. His name escapes me, but it was run offices for a business and then it was sold to the hotel business so no it, it wouldn't have had and um, we don't really know if the beer houses there were along by the wharf where I said by the ship by the wharf not in Stonehouse Court and also not in the church grounds so you know the church and the court are all combined so there, there wouldn't have been beer houses near there. Okay of course there's a bar in there now. Of course yes. So there's, we, we have got Stonehouse Court and Magpies, but you wouldn't describe them as pubs, really, because one's a club and the other's a hotel. Yeah, true enough. What about the uh, Comrades Club? Same principle, you wouldn't include it on the basis of being a club? The snooker club, as it was when I was younger. Oh, yes. Well, that was, diff that was different. That was a club as well, a bit like the Magpies. Um, you know, I used, used to play Skittles there, but, of course, that developed. That was a, a chapel initially, wasn't it? I don't that know. That building, yes. It, you can still see the stone. If you go into where um, Moss's um, second-hand place is, you can still see the stone dedicating it to Baptists, Methodists? Don't know. It's a, it was a chapel. And when the chapel closed, that's when Comrades Club took it over. Oh, right. And it was it was like the Magpies Club, that sort of thing, a club with a skit lally. Obviously, I never went in there because I was too young. Of course so you just were. the record... <laughs> Not me. It wasn't me. It was someone else. Um, Roy, a good more of a comment than a question from Roy. Roy, you've made me Google something and I've just done it. Roy says the Brewers Arms for many years was the Stonehouse Lodge of the R.A.O.B., popularly known as the Buffaloes. Many local working men spent regular nights at the lodge. And I just had to Google R.A.O.B. And rather amazingly, it is the Royal Antidiluvian Order of Buffaloes. <laughs> yes. And I didn't know we had, a, well, I didn't know it existed or that we had a branch in Stonehouse, but do you know anything about that, Vicky? Well, I don't know that particular thing, but what I missed out of my talk, I mean, I went on for ages. There's so much more you could have because so many of them were meeting rooms for that type of thing, like Toc H, like... Um, Oh, what's it? Rotary or all that sort of thing. That's where they were meeting. And when we talked about the tokens, um, you know, very often when those groups like the Royal Order, the Buffalo and that met, I mean, not in Roy's day, but previous to that, um, that that's what happened. They exchanged these tokens for the for the rent of the room so that then the landlord's going to get the money through the beer. But the people who attended also got their free token to get their beer. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another story. The Globe particularly was home to lots of those meetings and not just you know, all, all sorts of charity meetings and things like that went on in that one and in the and in the Crown and Anchor all sorts of meetings went went on in those places which is an, another thing to research really I could probably do a talk on that I expect mm. and again another sort of question or a thought from me Vicky if you don't mind I mean when so many pubs close over a relatively short period of time as, as we've seen in Stonehouse I mean, what sort of impact do you think that has on the community they used to be such community places have you said with all these different groups what do you think that does to a community when all the public houses close? Well, when you look back at the photos we've got from the Gazette, which were, you know, between the 70s and 90s, and you can see all the things that were put on, like the bed race, the welly walk, all those sorts of things. A lot of those things were organised through the pubs. You know, the people were getting together for, with their mates at the pubs. So that sort of thing 
it has hasn't stopped exactly because it's been it's been organized by different people town council have tried to other people have had various things but i don't think we've got as many as as the events that we used to have and also when you think when i used to go in the pubs in the 70s we used to have so many musical events. I mean, Crown and Anchor had a folk club, discos, parties, went on in that assembly hall in the Crown and Anchor. And so did other places. I mean, Spa Inn used to have live music every weekend. Well, because all those pubs are closed, where's those musical events and those live events that went on? That They don't happen, do they? So, well, as far as I know, they don't. So we've, we've lost a massive amount. We've lost a lot of community facilities through that, I think. Makes it more important to appreciate what we've got left, I suppose, and try and... Well, we haven't got enough space. You know, when we were looking for History Group to try and, because we didn't think we'd fit into the new library town hall, there isn't enough space. Community centres booked every, every night, Park Infants, Park Junior booked up every night, and there, there is... We, we could really, really do with a, another big community hall somewhere. It's not going to happen. But, you know, we, we haven't got enough space for all the meetings. Of course, I said there weren't things going on. There's plenty of clubs. There's plenty of things like dog training, yoga, Weight Watchers, history group, stuff like that. I think what we've lost is the more jolly stuff. <laughs> You know the entertainment, the the music, the the parties, that sort of thing. You know, you tell me if things like that go on like they used to. I, I don't think they do. So of course no, they go in. People go into Stroud. You know, yeah. we do them. But. And I suppose there's more stuff to do. Television, Netflix. Exactly, Sky. they're all on social media. Yeah. <laughs> Get people on online. That's what we're calling for. But we've only got to. Drink more. You don't often hear that, do you? On a, you don't hear that enough as a public health message. That's not from Stonehouse Town Council. We ask you to drink responsibly, of course. Of course. Um, don't Shirley, drink on a Monday. <laughs> of course. Um, Shirley said, Shirley's written in the comments, Nigel says the pool to baptise people is still under there. I assume you mean the uh, Comrades Club. Yes, is it? Oh, perhaps we ought to open it up and have visits. That's exciting. <laughs> the pool is still there well I don't know how much Nigel has changed I don't I know he's got loads of stuff because Nigel keeps all his um, stock in in what was comrades so I I don't know how much that building has changed inside whether he just keeps it inside as it were Nigel needs to tell us what (laughs) if it still looks like it did I I think not I think it's sort of warehousey he's got all his stuff in there but perhaps we ought to be allowed in to see the pool. Oh, Shirley says he hasn't changed anything, just uses it for storage. Oh, there you are. It could be reopened. Yeah, right. So if anybody needs a beer and a baptism <laughs> yes. and a game of snooker afterwards, <laughs> oh. one-stop shop. Well, look, I think that is, that's all the questions we've had in, and I think that's most of the, the comments in the chat sort of dealt with so unless anyone's got anything absolutely burning they want to contribute within the next sort of five or ten seconds no there's nothing popping up well in that case i suppose i i would just say thank you very much vicky and thank you very much all of you for watching i don't know vicky you know far more than i do uh, about the whole organization everything i don't know if you've got anything about any upcoming events or any more information you want to sort of share with everybody well next month we've got val kirby talking about oh i've forgotten the title of her talk but she's talking about the canal and the landscape the local landscape is is what she's it's not just about cotswold canals it's i i've forgotten the title of the talk i'm very sorry it's on my website but we we're not totally sure about the date we're going to do it because val's booked in and she's booked in been booked in for months for the wednesday the whatever it is of november but of course you can't do Wednesdays. So we're gonna to have to talk this through about whether we change the date or continue with the date. December meeting, we want to try and do a show and tell. 
So again, we need to talk about the date. We need to see how we can work that. And we need to see who's prepared to do that on Zoom. I don't think we're going to be able to have our usual wine and nibbles made by Shirley. But we will be doing something in November and December. But you'll have to watch this space for the. But oh, if people got any requests, because uh, I haven't at the moment booked anything for 2021 because it's all so unknown. You know, we don't know what we're doing. So at the moment, I haven't booked anything for that. I, I'm imagining it's going to be continuing with Zoom. So if people got any topics they'd like us to try and do via the Zoom, I mean, the, the pubs, if they want us to do it, um, or, or, you know, whatever they, they might be interested in, it'd be helpful if people could, um, you know, let us know what they might want to hear on Zoom, because I think we're going to be doing that for a while, going by you know what what we hear on the news yeah. you never know <laughs> eventually go, we'll be back at park hopefully but at the moment we're not so an open invitation to everybody to, to volunteer or to suggest topics or whatever else yeah brilliant well i think i think we'll leave it there okay thanks very much john for doing that very thank you very much Vicky, thank you for asking me and thank you oh how many attendees well, yeah. it says 32 at the moment, but it definitely went up to about 35 at one point. Oh, brilliant. Well, that's really good. So, yes. So plenty of you out there. Thank you all so much. Have a yeah, lovely Thanks evening. very much, everybody. See you soon. Okay, then. Bye. Bye. Bye.